series run by myself and Professor Andrew Arvada from the New School uh, on um, populism and religion. And it is funded first by an IRCPL grant, Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life at Columbia grant. Um, and in addition, it's also part of a broader initiative that's funded by the President's Global Innovation Fund grant. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, Trezi, Nicole, and Walid um, for um, helping set this up. And uh, so let me quickly introduce Professor Theda Skashpo, although she hardly needs an introduction. She is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University. And over the past two decades, her research has primarily focused on healthcare reform, public policy and civic engagement, amidst the shifting inequalities in American democracy. And among her many books, she has authored, co-authored, authored Our Diminished Democracy, From Membership to Management in American Civic Life, Healthcare Reform and American Politics, and The Tea Party and the Remaking of, um, of Republican Conservatism. Uh, in addition to her teaching research, she serves as the director of the Scholars of um, of the Scholars Strategy Network, an organization with dozens of regional chapters that encourages nonpartisan public engagement by university-based scholars, building ties between academics and policymakers and civic groups. So her talk today is called The, Pol the Popular and Elite Roots of Republican Party Extremism, Extre <laughs> I'm having trouble with that word, Extremism in the United States, and I'd like you to welcome the discussion. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a delight to be back to Columbia on um, another late summer day in uh, November. And I'm looking forward to our, uh, our discussion when um, I, I get through uh, my, my remarks. Well, let me just plunge right in. Uh, there's a lot of debate right now about what the leading threat to U.S. democracy is. You know, right now we're having a resurgence of the Russian interference um, uh, theme. Um, there's a kind of more uh, long-standing uh, view associated with my colleague Bob Putnam and many others, citizen cynicism, cynicism, cynicism and withdrawal. Uh, lots of debates about angry populist voters, and I will uh, address uh, my take on that in a bit. Uh, and of course, uh, just an absolute riveting on the personal pathologies of uh, the truly bizarre, and I would say evil man, who is President of the United States. But the answer that I'm going to give to the real threat to American democracy in this period is Republican Party extremism. Um, because I think it's quite a big deal in, a t in a t essentially a two-party system, uh, in which my, most, can, most uh, citizens feel they need to choose between two major parties in each election. Um, for one of the two major parties to, to show a growing willingness to accept executive abuses, uh, to engage in the systematic subversion of democratic participation, above all through vote suppression, and to push extreme and unpopular laws that are aimed at eviscerating the capacities of government. Uh, that's, that's a pretty big deal. So um, I want to talk about um, how we should understand uh, what's going on. Just so that you're clear that it is going on, let me uh, draw from the quantitative measures that political scientists use, um, in this case, using the House of Representatives to measure movement away from the middle. And, uh, you know, if we take the long picture in, uh, since the mid-20th century in America, we can see that from the 40s to the 60s, and above all, after, the, after 1960 to, the, to 1980, there was a sorting out, a moving away that's roughly symmetrical between the Democrats and the Republicans. That's in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Revolution that allowed African Americans to vote uh, and uh, spurred the transition of white uh, Southerners away from the Democratic Party. Um, and I can remember when I was young that there were liberal Republicans. Uh, I mean, there, there really aren't anymore. Um, and then the other uh, figure that I'd like to draw your attention to is this one, which just is self, oh, well, but I want to point out, and the period that I'm going to be looking at is the period since 2000, when um, continuing polarization is not a two-sided thing. It's asymmetric to the right. 
and really um, on these measures, which are mainly about government's role in the economy, the House Republicans and other Republicans continue to move ever further right and it just doesn't stop. And that blows up a central tenet of political science, which believes in the median voter theory, that parties will compete for the middle. That's simply not been the case. Uh, even in terms of their self-identification, uh, or some kind of objective measure and self-identification combined, uh, Republicans who are ideologically moderate are just disappearing. Whereas Democrats are pretty much, you know, standing pat all this time. Now, I'm going to be focusing especially on the question that I'm sure interests everybody now, which is why is this process of Republican extremism, of movement ever further to the nether right, uh, reached most of the debate about why that has happened, I think has focused way too much on Trump's personality, riveting as it is, and uh, also on demographic categories of mass motivations of voters. Um, I'm dubious about the latter, it's not irrelevant, but I don't think the public is driving what's happening here, public opinion or voter preferences, and I'll make that case during this lecture. Um, but it's, it's really uh, a mistake to try to decipher all of this as a function of Trump personally, because he is very much a symptom of what I'm going to be talking about here. He's a very dangerous symptom, because he, he's, he's the President of the United States but he's not the cause. So I'll be developing several themes here as we go forward. I think Trump could seize the nomination and I'll spend most of my lecture on this because after the 2000s, uh, the, the Republican Party has been boosted and torn asunder at the same time by competing forces of popular nativism on the one hand, first manifest in the Tea Party rebellions in an explosive way, and uh, by extra party elite capture, which I'm going to focus mainly on the growth of the Koch network and its impact, but that's not the only piece of that. Uh, then when we get to the election itself, Trump, it's very important to remember that Trump won the Electoral College. He did not win any kind of national, we don't have a national election in this country. And that was because he was able to get huge non, he was able to rack up huge margins in non-metropolitan, uh, non-big city areas. And he did that not simply with, uh, by force of personality or media, but because he had organized support from Christian evangelical networks, the National Rifle Association, business networks, all of those garden variety Republican networks, and a little extra push from police unions, which I'll say a bit about more later. Uh, and then the final, I'll, I'll get to the end here and talk a little bit about why Trump's presidency <laughs> is pushing forward full speed with largely unpopular policies, especially when we're talking about taxes, social spending, government's role in the economy. Um, and that's because uh, he's really not in the driver's seat here. He's fallen back on, on, on a network of the, uh, that controls uh, government agendas and Republican candidates and office holders across most states as well as at the national level. So, uh, just so you'll know, um, I'm going to be making a lot of assertions in this lecture because I'm going to move through a lot of things to offer a big picture uh, interpretation. And I know there are people who will stand up and go after it in the question period, and that's fine. I'm looking forward to that. But just to mention, I am drawing on three major research studies. Um, Back in 2011 to 12, Vanessa Williamson, who's now at the Brookings Institution, and I did the book on the Tea Party, and that involved a lot of interviews with grassroots right-wing activists who formed 900 local Tea Parties across the country, and who, if they're still alive now, are certainly enthusiasts for Donald Trump, uh, and their successors are uh, like-minded. Um, then, um, I, I've also been working with Columbia University's own Alex Hurdle Fernandez, Professor Alex Hurdle Fernandez at the School of International and Public Affairs, on um, uh, an ongoing shifting terrain project in which we're really analyzing the cha changing array of organizations operating on the left and the right, nationally and across the states, looking at uh, changes in think tanks, party committees, advocacy groups, constituency mobilizing organizations, and organized mega donor consortia, groups of wealthy millionaires and billionaires who engage in sustained giving that I'll be talking about quite a bit because they're aiming to change the policy agendas 
and the organizational terrain on which politics occurs, not just single elections. And that research has led to the new discoveries about the Coke Network that I will present shortly. And then just to mention, and even though we'll only make a couple of little cameo appearances in, our, in two slides, um, after the election, uh, three of us at Harvard, Kathy Swartz, a health economist, uh, sociologist Mary Waters and I, uh, assembled a team of graduate and undergraduate students that we're tracking developments in eight pro-Trump counties, um, outside of big cities, one a medium city area, one a town-like area, uh, two apiece in North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. That's so that we can get a sense of what's actually happening on the ground, where we're repeatedly visiting and interviewing. My part of it is to interview uh, local uh, party leaders, civic leaders, newspaper people, business leaders, and as it happens, the leaders of indivisible resistance movements that exist in all these eight conservative places and are quite lively. So um, that's the evidentiary base from which I'm going to be making bold assertions. All right, so I'd like to talk about the first big piece of this, which is the continuing rightward lunge of the Republican Party in the 2000s. And that has happened because of a convergence of separate but equally potent popular and elite prongs of pressure and leverage on the Republican Party, on its candidates and its office holders. The first one I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, it, it broke out in the uh, months into a Barack Obama's presidency when one of these conjunctures that tends to arouse popular uh, uh, anger and fear on the opposite side of the spectrum occurred. That is the Democrats, and it's kind of hard to remember this, but there was a moment when the Democrats uh, controlled everything in Washington, D.C., and the presidency and both houses of Congress, and people, pundits were writing about a permanent a Democratic takeover that was inevitable. At that moment, um, a Tea Party uh, upsurge occurred, and some people on the left said it was just AstroTurf, that it was just Fox News and the Koch brothers. Um, our research, Vanessa's and mine, showed that that was not at all true. We identified ultimately 900 uh, uh, spontaneously, voluntarily formed, regularly meeting local Tea Parties of conservative activists and uh, newly aroused conservative minded citizens to the right of the Republican Party that farmed all over the country. And uh, we found in our research that their top concern was not cutting public spending. I mean, that's what the national advocacy groups on TV were telling us was their top concern. But their real concern was anger about immigration, about uh, the racial and generational transformations in the country. Um, and that was the core of the popular anger that fueled this, the Tea Party upsurge that helped Republicans, a new wave of Republicans go into office in 2010 and after. And um, at the time we were doing our face-to-face -face interviews with Tea Party activists, that was the spring of 2011, Donald Trump first came out as a birther. And our informants, at that point, were all looking for a non-Mitt Romney. I mean, you know, anybody. Remember, they experimented with all those other non-Mitt Romneys. Uh, but they would have all gone for Donald Trump in a minute because he was encapsulating this anxiety and anger about the uh, changes in the, in, in the cultural and, and kind of uh, meaning of the country and also uh, the anxiety and fear that existed in the wake of 9-11 and the anger against Muslims. All right, so that's the popular prong. And that's been there. Um, I think that although the Tea Parties are no longer meeting, the people of light mind uh, are many of the grassroots activists in the Republican Party, and I'll later say that those with those kinds of concerns were uh, very likely to support Trump over other Republicans as well as over Democrats. But now let me switch to talking at some length about the elite takeover or pressures on the Republican Party apparatus, because I think that story is a little less well known. Uh, in the Shifting Terrain Project, the first thing we did <coughs> was to draw up lists of organizations in the categories you see on this slide that uh, uh, were active to the right and the left on the national spectrum and just do the simple thing of figuring out what their budgets were in 2002 and again in 2014. And one of the things that became apparent very soon after we started just simple descriptive analysis of that data, and for the graduate students in the room, I'd like to urge you uh, to resist the temptation to do fancy statistical anything <laughs> until you have done uh, rigorous description. 
Not anecdotes, but there's something in between anecdotes and overly sophisticated statistical models. So this is in that middle ground, and we discovered very, very quickly, and this is just the picture on the right, it's very different on the left, the shares didn't change all that much from 2002 to 2014, we picked non-presidential years, and in particular the Democratic Party committees held their own compared to the various outside groups. But you can see here that the Republican Party committee's shares plummeted over that short time span, and a lot of the resources were shifting to non-party funders, above all the Koch seminars that I'm about to talk about, and uh, to uh, constituency organizations, including one, uh, Americans for Prosperity, that's a centerpiece of the uh, Koch operation. And in fact, the list of organizations, long-standing and new, that account for this shift that you see summarized in this graph includes mainly Koch-directed operations accounting for the shift from 2002 to 2014. Um, well, we also discovered very soon that the amount of resources that the Koch operation could uh, deploy in 2008, 2010, 2012, 2014, and 2016 was growing pretty steadily and rivaling the Republican Party itself and has overtaken it. Part of our research has been to acknowledge that wealthy millionaires and billionaires have organized consortia to try to shape the terrain of American politics on the left as well as the right. Uh, the Koch seminars are the major group effort on the right, uh, founded in 2003 and carried forward since then, meeting twice a year in posh resorts where now over 500 people assemble twice a year, and entire resorts are rented and ringed by security. But twice a year also, wealthy, progressive-minded uh, millionaires and billionaires of the Democracy Alliance meet. They now meet in entire wings of urban luxury hotels. <laughs> I've been to some of the meetings. Um, they're very, very nice hotels, really very nice. And uh, there was a time when they rented one of the same resorts that the Coke Network did, uh, not at the same time, of course. Uh, uh, but as you can see, uh, our best estimate through a lot of research on the sort of size of the partner units in blue, those are individuals or fam wealthy families that join uh, the Democracy Alliance, and then reported attendance of people at the Coke seminars. So these are not exactly the same unit necessarily. But it, look at the trends, not the levels, and you can see that one side here has overtaken the other um, for quite some time. And um, similarly, the amount of funds to join these wealthy people co political consortia, you have to pledge to give uh, 100 to 200 thousand dollars a year minimum now to approved other organizations or causes. And that's on top of your dues and, uh, and, and paying your way to the resort for the multi-day meeting. And most of them give a lot more, but particularly in the Koch seminars. We don't know exactly how much they give, but we know that if you divide the amounts of money by 500, it, it's more. Um, so um, the membership has translated into the ability to uh, deploy very disparate amounts of money. I mean, we're talking about real money here either way, in the hundreds of billions, but uh, you can see how much more we estimate that the Koch seminars are deploying, raising. Uh, and then the final point I want to make about the two sides, and I, then I'll go back to the Koch, is that probably the amounts of money are not the most important story. I mean, I could have just stopped the lecture right there if we were at a typical leftist gathering. And you know, in my citizen capacity, I've been to some of those. Uh, people all argue that it's all about money. It's all money. They've got more, we've got less. Um, and our research suggests that, yeah, that's probably true, although it wasn't always true, it's become more true. Uh, but um, the real story is how the money is spent. 
And both of these wealthy consortia are in the business of trying to support and, and coordinate and encourage entire arrays of think tanks, constituency mobilizing groups, um, and uh, issue advocacy groups to change not just election outcomes, but to change the agendas of government that are followed by those who are elected. And what we find, we just happen to have, because uh, the muckraking journalists on the right and left pick up documents left on the floor or in hotel rooms after the meetings of these secretive organizations, God bless their little souls, <laughs> um, right and left alike, We've analyzed those, and we happen to have comparable data for 2013-14. And on the left here, you see the Democracy Alliance pattern, in which they spread 144.6 million to as many as 173 progressive organizations. Um, the blue ones are long-time core things like Media Matters and Center for American Progress. Uh, the red ones are other highly recommended groups. But in order to corral rich people on the left, the Democracy Alliance lets them give to pretty much anything they want. And so that's 100, uh, more than 100 others that count toward that minimum for membership. On the other side, and then we, we, this is only about half the money that the Koch seminars deployed during that year, but it's the half that's reported in tax reports for um, uh, Freedom Partners, which is the sort of bank that coordinates the flows of money in politics. And it, it, its reports show that um, uh, a certain amount of money was scattered around the red part there to a lot of leftist organizations, some business organizations, some gun organizations, some right to left organizations. But most of it went to just eight core organizations directly run by Koch operatives whose, uh, whose activities are closely coordinated. So that brings us to what the Koch political network is, because the Democracy Alliance is in the business of raising a lot of progressive money and scattering it among hundreds of causes and issue groups run by professionals. But the Koch seminars raise more money and concentrated it, concentrated on a tightly knit, small L Leninist type operation. So you have free market progressivism, and no, 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 you have progressive market anarchy on the left, and you have free market Leninism on the right. What is that money going to? Well, the Kochs have long supported Cato, Mercatus, the Koch Foundation, and through the Koch Foundation, many university people now, including some of my colleagues in the government department at Harvard. Uh, there was a phase of, after they got going with uh, ideas, which they take very seriously, that they funded advocacy groups in the energy, healthcare area in particular. Uh, but by the time you get to the 2000s, with the founding of the Koch seminars and as a mechanism to draw in Mr. and Mrs. Ohio widget manufacturer, lots of people uh, into a like-minded endeavor with David and Charles Koch, uh, and channel their, their contributions, at least half of them, it, from each meeting through the Freedom Partners, the money is going to a much more tightly knitted, knitted political party-like operation centered on Americans for Prosperity, but also with endeavors to gather data uh, and, and share that data uh, during policy and election campaigns, uh, and for a time, young people, that's Generation Opportunity, and Libre, reaching out to Hispanics. Our research has managed for the first time to reconstruct the development of the Americans for Prosperity since its founding in 2004. We've done that not by following the money, but by following the people. Uh, I wasn't the one who learned to use the Wayback Machine on the internet. That naturally took younger people who learned to do that and then taught me uh, as well. But we have gone back and found the web pages for the first 15 state organizations founded by Americans for Prosperity <coughs> from 2004 through 2007. Now one of the things I want you to see on this map, I mean, for one thing, they go in 2005 from five states covering 16% of the US population 
2017, 36 states covering 82% of the U.S. population. But notice the darkest parts of the map here, because that's the period 2004 to 2007, before Barack Obama came into the presidency, before Jane Mayer says the Kochs geared up. They were geared up already under George W. Bush. And look where they were organizing, not just in Kansas and Oklahoma, the low-hanging fruit on the right, or Texas. They were reaching into what turned out later to be critical, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, so. Uh, what we've done is to reconstruct the careers of all the people appointed to be state directors in these, this critical middle tier in this federated political party-like operation on the far right. It's run out of a corporate headquarters in Arlington with ruthless centralization and discipline on message and personnel. If you don't do well in the Americans for Prosperity, you lose your job within months. It's not a process of fairness and decision making uh, to be fair that we would go through on the left. Um, but um, it's also federated, and that's crucial because it has a presence and capacities to mobilize money, ideas, and activists and lobbyists in state legislative campaigns and local government campaigns, as well as congressional and presidential efforts. In fact, I consider it the third major political party in the United States, and in my visit to Winnebago County last spring, Oshkosh, downtown Oshkosh, has storefronts for the three major political parties in America, all lined up on the same main street. There's the Democrats, the Republicans, and across the street from the Republicans, Americans for Prosperity. Because they have regional offices all over Wisconsin, filling in yet another level of the Federation. Now, AFP is a remarkable organization. I'm not sure anything like this has ever been seen in American politics. It combines central direction with federated organization. It deploys grassroots activists, lobbying, media, and money continuously in elections and ongoing issue campaigns. So in no way does it stand down from election to election. It adds new half to state level policy campaigns working in close cooperation with the American Legislative Exchange Council, which enrolls mainly Republican members of legislatures and provides them with model bills. And it works closely with uh, free market think tanks that exist in all 50 states. Um, it maintains a ruthlessly disciplined focus on tax cuts, opposition to business and environmental regulations, cuts in social spending, and strips to weaken public sector unions. Uh, because in many ways, AFP considers itself to be an alternative to the public sector unions, and they see them as the principal enemy. And I'm not making that up. They say that openly in public statements. The ultimate reason that it's important for our story today is that AFP has come to parallel and leverage the Republican Party by offering a combination of ideas, agenda items, inducements in the form of support uh, for legislative uh, things and elections, and threats to Republicans who do not go along with what they want. And because they exist everywhere that Republicans have to run and operate, uh, they've been very effective in doing that. They've also interpenetrated the staffs of Republican candidates and office holders. And in the work that we did on the careers of the state directors, we were able to figure out where did they come from before they served as AFP state directors and where did they go after they served. And they were often drawn out of Republican campaign staffs or legislative staff operations or congressional staff. And then after their time in AFP, if they were promoted upward in the co network, which they often are, they would go back to higher level positions. For example, Corey Lewandowski, the director of AFP in New Hampshire, became uh, for some time the campaign director for Donald Trump. And uh, Scott Hagerstrom, the long-term head of uh, AFP in Michigan, became uh, the head of the uh, 
extra uh, Republican Trump supporting effort in the state of Michigan. Um, I'm just going to move very quickly to say that it matters because the Koch network has really induced and pushed Republicans and persuaded Republicans into supporting a whole series of issue stands, particularly on issues of the government's role in the economy, that are not popular with most Americans. And in fact, are not popular with most Republicans in many cases. Uh, for example, most Republicans uh, some time ago wanted to raise the minimum wage, but, um, and that continues to be true, but AFP fiercely opposes that. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> Opposition to collective bargaining rights for public sector workers is at the top of their agenda, but most Americans don't support that. Um, keeping and improving health reform was always something that most people wanted, and now they really want it, but AFP has gone to the wall against the Obamacare and against the Medicaid expansions of the states. Uh, and you can see the others here. We've done specific research, uh, I'll just mention this, to look to see whether when you control for all the other things that might be going on in states that passed anti-union legislation, uh, was having an AFP director net of partisanship of public opinion, did that help to predict the states that passed it? And the answer is yes. Uh, same thing is true in the work we've done, very systematic work on which Republican states accepted the Medicaid expansions and which did not. The strength of the right-wing networks in the states, including AFP, the think tanks and ALEC is a powerful predictor of why Republicans would buck even favorable Republican uh, business opinion in resisting taking millions and billions of dollars to Medicaid for Medicaid expansion to the near poor. So let me just sum up this part of my lecture by saying that long before the latest elections, long before Donald Trump descended the golden escalator. Um, <laughs> Both of these elite and popular thrusts from without uh, the, the formal Republican committees and office holder core had uh, pummeled the party and pushed it. And you know, you can say in many ways they boosted it. Our popular enthusiasm helped to elect a lot of Republicans when Democrats stayed home in midterm elections. Um, and um, Coke money and Coke organization. I would say even more Coke organization has helped um, office holders win office uh, on the Republican tickets, build super majorities in many states. But at the same time that these forces may have boosted Republicans during the Obama era, they were also tearing it asunder. Because the top priority for the popular thrust has always been anger about immigration, determination to demonize Muslims. Uh, at home and on a world scale, uh, and of course uh, the usual brew of anxiety about uh, black people and people of color getting too much that they don't deserve. There's also a real anger at young people in America, including people in their own families, and we found in the Tea Party research. But the top agenda for the Koch network is ultra free market. Um, Policies, including dismantling the Social Security, Medicare, and Veterans benefits that are actually the lifeline for many of the popular Tea Party people and the popular Trump supporters now, uh, who will tell you quite openly that they think Americans have earned those and that they should not be taken away. So, um, part of the reason that the stage was set for Donald Trump was that this internal rending, rending had gone quite far, but it had not yet captured, it had not yet kept, uh, created a situation in which Republican uh, elites and their billionaire and millionaire allies lost control of the Republican nomination for president. That didn't happen in 2012. It didn't happen, well, 2012 is the key point time. But it did happen in 2015 and 16 because Donald Trump managed to use his media savvy and his explicit appeals to the popular thrust beating on the Republican Party to clear away all of his competitors in the Republican field.
just briefly after I say a bit more about that. In the general election, he again mobilized those popular status resentments, but very much simply to supplement the core GOP networks that swung behind him in the general election. To me, the most interesting piece of data that I have about the 2015-16 election cycle is this uh, survey that was taken by the Pew Research Center in May of 2015. It shows the degree to which ordinary Republican identifiers in the electorate were angry at their own party leaders for failing on government spending issues. That's partly Obamacare, but you could consider just about anything the Republicans were trying to do or failing to do. Anger at them for not taking the steps the popular supporters wanted about curbing illegal immigration and same-sex marriage. And, you know, both uh, Democrats and Republicans were angry at their party establishments, but the anger is so much greater on the Republican side. And that's just as, as we know, about a dozen establishment Republicans were about to start vying for the nomination. So lo and behold, Donald Trump appears. And he's very good at playing the media and he capturing about 40%, not the majority, but enough to dispatch a fragmented field of uh, mainstream, Repub well, mainstream, very far right Republican contenders that he dispatched one after another and humiliated in the process. Um, we know that um, much of it was playing the media, and not just the right-wing media, but the entire media that was absolutely fascinated by this performance. Um, the research shows that um, about uh, $2 billion of free media coverage from all of the, the outlets, including the mainstream outlets, uh, went to Donald Trump, uh, compared to quite a lot for Hillary Clinton, much less for Bernie Sanders and, and Ted Cruz, the last man standing in the Republican primary, and then we've got even less after that. And uh, most of the coverage of Clinton was negative. Uh, and most of the coverage of Trump was either horse race, or he's winning, or isn't it weird that he's winning, or positive. But let me say a little bit more about the deeper trends that fueled the support for Trump, because I'm not suggesting that there weren't some of these deeper trends in the, in the, in the, in the Republican base that were at work. Um, we, I think it's fair to say that in the United States, as in quite a few other countries across the world, rapid immigration in the recent period has sparked fears. And those fears are express, ex, ex, especially likely to be explosive in the United States in areas of the country that are not big cities, that don't in fact have a lot of immigrants, and where um, uh, people are in smaller uh, communities looking at things play out in the media and, um, uh, and imagining things that might be happening or that are happening on a very small scale. Uh, I'll also say something about the changing religious landscape because Donald Trump received crucial support from Christian evangelicals in this um, election. Um, and in every case, we need to keep in mind that the Electoral College favors those who can organize widely across many states and across many districts inside states. Here's the picture of immigration. Uh, the blue bars are what has actually happened through 2010, and you can see that it's not an all-time high of immigrants in the U.S. population, but it's a high point. The period since 1965 has been a period of rapid immigration into the United States and from non-European areas especially. Uh, and then the red bars are what might is projected. And of course those projections are what scare or are used to scare a lot of people um, on the right. I find these maps that are not very clear to read fascinating, but in 2010, you can see that the largest immigrant group in most states was from Mexico, so it's not at all coincidental that Donald Trump went after Mexicans uh, when he descended the golden staircase. Uh, and this is what it looked like 100 years ago. It's very different. Now, we know that Donald Trump, compared to other Republicans, attracted support from Republican voters who said that they were concerned 
about growing numbers of newcomers from other countries threatening U.S. values. That's the biggest outlier that sets Trump Republicans against other Republicans in this polling. Also, worry about Islam, that it's likely to encourage violence. Trump people think that more than other Republicans. We're not talking about compared to New York City Democrats. So forget yourselves here. It's <laughs> other Republicans that we're talking about. Um, and then there's some worry about business. But notice that the worry about business profits is much less than the worry about Islam and immigration. In my visit to Catawba County, North Carolina, I saw this in action, and also Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Both of those are part of our study of the eight counties. Luzerne County, Pennsylvania is where Dominicans coming from New York into Hazleton uh, gave uh, Representative Lou Barletta, who was mayor of Hazleton at the time, the chance to switch from being a Democrat to being a Republican and to launch himself as a Trump Republican before Trump. He is now about to probably win the nomination to, ch to challenge Bob Casey to try to take that anti-immigrant message statewide. In Catawba County, North Carolina, the battle is fought out between groups of religious-minded people. Uh, when we drove in last June along I-40 into Hickory, North Carolina, we were greeted by this billboard announcing that uh, the 19 Muslim immigrants had killed uh, 3,000 uh, Americans. Nobody mentions that they didn't come from the places that Trump's travel ban was about, but this is to support the Trump travel ban. It's said to be by, from the North Carolina Pastors Association, although I have to tell you I've not been able to find a single pastor in North Carolina or anybody who knows one who actually uh, signed on to this billboard. Um, on the other hand, uh, not too long after, the North Carolina Council of Churches, which is careful to tell you that they represent more than 6,000 congregations, put up another billboard with a biblical theme, uh, quoting from Leviticus, uh, in opposition. But it's a, it's, a, it's a flashpoint there between left and right. And uh, it's very much about the religious perceptions of Islam. Now, the final thing I want to say about the Trump coalition, final two things, point to the changing uh, religious landscape. I think a lot of people who engage in demographic analysis say, oh, those evangelical white Protestants are in decline. Well, that's true. But the problem is they vote. <laughs> They vote in general elections, and they vote in local elections, and they vote in state elections, and they vote in midterm elections. And so they carry far more of, than their weight. And moreover, they are spread out over the geography of the Midwest and the South and the inner West. So they make a ready-made place. One of my interviewees during the research at the local level told me that he and his friends believed that Trump had been sent by God to save America. I wrote that down in my notes and maintained a, a calm demeanor. <laughs> and then there's law and order. You know, I think a lot of us who are my age wondered when Trump stood before that convention and, you know, basically trotted Nixon out again. Wait a minute, is this really going to work now with violence? declining with uh, the proportions of the population that you could appeal to with this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, I have a graduate student who has just done a very interesting piece of research. He got a hold of the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge list and membership list. The Fraternal Order of Police is the white police union in much of the country. And it turns out that net of all of the other partisan and social and immigration attitude and economic factors that might support, educational factors that support, that predict vote for Trump, the nearby presence of uh, a fraternal order of police uh, operation, and they were all out there loudly endorsing Trump and talking about how terrible Black Lives Matter was and how much of a threat it was to America. Uh, and the per capita number of, of, of members in the area is a strong predictor, statistically significant. So I think the law and order piece of this is one of the ways in which black, white, racial issues came into the election along with immigration. We know that the real key to what happened in November 
was that non-big city areas that Barack Obama lost by 60-40 were lost by Hillary Clinton by margins of 70-30 or 80-20. So in many ways, this was a town and a smaller medium city revolt against metropolitan America. And the list of places and dates that Trump held his rallies reveals that he was all over those non-big metro areas of the key states repeatedly. And in the eight counties I'm visiting, all the Republicans reported knowing about and attending nearby rallies. Uh, and all of them said that Hillary Clinton's campaign never appeared there. Or sent some young man from Brooklyn that told him what to do, who didn't know what he was talking about. That happened in a couple of cases. So the picture is that lots of counties flipped. The dark red are counties that voted for Obama. This is from John Mullen Crawford, CUNY. Um, and flipped to, to Trump in this election. And you can see that there are a lot more of them than dark blue that flipped the other way. Um, Trump counties have more voters who are US born. And they are very likely to have people who say that their identity is American. So that's all I have to say about how that Tea Party popular thrust that we first saw in the early Obama era metastasized into um, a base of enthusiasm for Donald Trump. I come down on the socio-cultural side of the argument over whether it was mainly anxiety about a changing social and cultural competition of the country lay, overlaid on racial tensions um, compared to the argument about whether it's closing factories. I'm not saying that closing factories didn't lie behind some of the sense of being left out that you get in a lot of these smaller communities, but most of the factories closed quite a while ago, and many of these areas have new factories. Um, now, let me wrap up by saying the so what part of this. <laughs> we know that a presidential election that was won by a hair in the Electoral College has opened the door to truly sweeping changes, and those changes are proceeding. No matter what we all watch on MSNBC about the Russia investigation. Uh, that's because the Republican Party is at this point a truly radical and mobilized defensive party, and it claims a sweeping mandate to save America, regardless of whether it has any popular majority or pop public opinion. That's partly because of the anger and fear of the popular base over issues of generational and cultural and racial change, but it's also because free market ideologues and supporters of racial ethnic crackdowns, different elite groups are pressing those radical agendas on office holders and telling them they'll withhold money or run challenges against them if they don't go along. GOP elites, by which I mean people who are in office or are running for office and hoping for support from the party committees, are fragmented and cowed by a popular base whose resentments they do not fully understand and they thought they could use and control, but now have woke, waken up to realize that uh, the tiger might, might just turn around and eat them. Um, and then the final point I want to make is that in many ways, policy after an election is over is personnel. And Donald Trump really did have a lot of organized networks behind him in the general election, but he didn't have experts or um, uh, intellectuals or policy makers in waiting to go into his administration. And, and in fact, since he opposes anybody who said anything critical about him during the election, he really has even fewer than he might have had. So guess what happened after the election? Uh, within days, uh, members of the Koch network, um, experts who had grown up inside that network, key operatives from that network, politicians that had been to Koch seminar meetings and were cooperating with the Koch agenda for many years, suddenly emerged as the people who were staffing the White House and staffing the, especially the domestic cabinet positions. Um, the entire agenda was handed over to them in, in areas like repeal of Obamacare, taxes and spending, the environment. Um, 
regardless of what Trump had said um, during the heat of the moment in the election campaign. And um, in fact, um, the head of the um, White House Director for Legislative Affairs is Mark Short, the former head of Freedom Partners, which is that centerpiece organization in the Coke Network that gathers the money and deploys it. Um, Vice President Pence is a longtime protege of the Coke uh, Network, and he was given a lot of say over the agenda. We all know about De Betsy DeVos's appointment. Um, there are second level of people being appointed in a lot of these places. Um, and uh, they have uh, set out to carry through the agenda. And Charles and David Koch themselves, who had refused to endorse Donald Trump during the campaign, you know, probably partly out of sincere belief that they didn't care for some of his anti-immigrant uh, racial um, rhetoric, but probably mostly because they didn't think he would win, um, look how broadly Charles is smiling at the first Koch seminar meeting that was held right after Trump went into office that started with a pre-meeting sit down with Vice President Pence to talk about their strategy for eviscerating social spending and, and slashing taxes um, and of course eliminating environmental policies and regulations. So, I won't spend too much time on this. In many ways, the agenda is moving forward, mainly through executive action, but partly congressional in the environmental and global warming area. I think you all know some of the steps that have already been taken, and that are being pushed forward as, as hard as they can. In immigration, it's almost entirely by executive action, and I would not attribute this mainly to the Coke Network. I think this is in many ways the part of the program that embodies the appeal to popular nativism. And of course it's being carried forward by Jeff Sessions at the, um, at the Justice Department and by General Kelly at Homeland Security and now as Chief of Staff. Uh, but in the area of health and social policies and the taxes that it takes to pay for them, um, the entire array of Koch influence, both in the congressional leadership and agenda setting and in what the White House is prepared to sign on to and promote, is on full display. They tried very hard to completely repeal the Affordable Care Act. And when they fell short on that, they pivoted instantly to perhaps the most important goal here, which is to cut taxes massively. Um, on business and the wealthy and set the stage for further discussions down the line uh, about the need to get rid of Obamacare, Social Security. <coughs> so the bottom line that I want to sum up here is that though they're partly at odds and partly complementary, both the Tea Party popular nativist thrust and the Koch network clout that was constructed deliberately in a shadow third political party, have been drivers of GOP extremism, even as they have hollowed out GOP institutions uh, in this period. Uh, that creates a pretty scary combination because a weak party is in some ways even more vulnerable to authoritarian turns than a strong party. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's, I think it's the case. The post-2000 Koch moves into party-like activities captured the GOP at all levels and added heft to the anti-government agendas that had already been pursued at an earlier time by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Club for Growth. Um, and that Koch network clout, which goes across levels of government and is just as important across the states as in Washington, um, supplemented by popular nativist fears and by Christian right fervor, to turn back the clock on, on abortion and, and, and gay rights. That explains the puzzling trends that we've seen, this asymmetric right polarization, the unresponsiveness of politicians to majority public opinion, and the continued advance as the relentless advance of unpopular policies that increase economic inequality and weaken our shared government capacities as Americans. And US federalism 
which rewards in a way a concerted player that can operate across levels and bridge the divided institutions is in this moment magnifying those tendencies. If you want to know what's next, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, I don't think the Republican Party I have just described is going to abandon Trump before the last wave goes over the top of the ship. Um, Intra-party tensions are going to continue, but until they lose elections, not, not Bob Mueller, until they lose elections, I don't think they'll turn on this president. His failures may prompt authoritarian moves, and the Republican Party in Congress and beyond may be too fragmented and cowed to check those moves. Now, there is a vibrant and widespread grassroots resistance in and around the Democratic Party. It's even more extensive across the political geography and has even more people involved in it, most of them women, than the Tea Party surge on the far right at a comparable juncture in the early Obama presidency. But, I found these groups in all of my conservative places, where big city left extremism takes center stage and turn off a lot of these resistors in the heartland of the country. They're not going to go for a lot of the stuff that's being pushed in San Francisco, New York, Boston. I hate to be the bearer of that news, but they just are. Uh, will the opposition organize across many states and localities? I think it already is, but will it maintain its enthusiasm and determination as we move beyond the battles over the Affordable Care Act, where they've all engaged? And will they channel their energies into voter registration and into actual votes? And here the comparison with the Tea Party back in 2009 to 11 is really a critical one. Because the Tea Parties were organizing a constituency, older white conservative minded people who always turn out in midterm elections. But the mainly older liberal women who are organizing the resistance movements across the heartland of America are going to have to encourage, persuade, and enable um, their neighbors and friends, including younger people, um, to turn out to vote. And they are not naturally likely to do so in the past in midterm elections. I think the next election, next week in Virginia, is going to tell us whether Trump-like appeals to outright racism and immigration bashing are enough to overcome whatever energy and resistance the center left can mobilize. And I think this is going to be a pivotal election in a midterm in Virginia. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but it's going to matter. It's going to send signals to the people across the land about what's possible or likely in the next phase of this perfect storm of convergence of elite and popular extremism that's captured the Republican Party. This is on? Yes. Thank you so much. Before I, I take questions and look at hands, I'm going to pose um, Tea Party and Trump supporters. How in particular do we address the religious, nationalist, populist, us versus them, friend, enemy, identity politics, wherein it seems that the relation of the Christian right to the Republican Party has shifted from being an alliance of autonomous, church-based, religious believers with the Republican Party focused on some policy goals, to what seems to me, at least, to have become a fused, single, extremely conservative religio-political identity. So last week, Roger Smith was here, and he, he addressed the status harms that religious conservatives feel in the context of a secular liberal national culture and what you talk about, their own diminished membership in cloud. And he argued that the way to disalign them from the extreme right populism is accommodation. Accommodation along the lines of Hobby Lobby. But we had a heated debate about that, as you can imagine. But what if of what is at issue is not religious belief so much as this fused religio-political social identity, what they accuse him of, 
you know, Muslims are having, and identifying uh, identification with an uncompromising conservative Tea Party branch of the Republican Party, so that if the status loss, and, and what if the status loss pertains not only to the loss of jobs that you've kind of dealt with, but to the dismantling of rather unjust social hierarchies, then wouldn't accommodation be tantamount to appeasement? On the other hand, we could try the class politics versus identity politics route, as suggested in today's op-ed, I don't know if you saw it, by erotics rather than ideological hostility, as you indicate, um, to social policy proposals, progressive ones, so you agree with them on this. His proposal is that we either adopt up for a left populist rhetoric versus the billionaire class, which makes me think of Sanders, or perhaps registering non-whites to vote. But my question then would be, how would policy proposals that make the case for more robust redistributive so social programs and public in inter interest regulation resonate with political identities that abhor government regulation and taxes? And how can we place our hopes in voter registration when white right wing Republicans are redistricting so as to diminish voter turnout? and uh, so successfully. So in short, I, I, I'd like to push you on what you would propose as a strategy to disalign and disaggregate religion from the ways right-wing political um, identity um, politics has so successfully merged it with conservatism and how we could address the status harms that key voting voters uh, feel if they see governmental redistribution, taxation, and public policy generally as dishonorable, suspect, and working to everybody's benefit except their own, apart from Medicare, Medicaid, I'm sorry, apart from Medicare and Social Security. And Medicaid now, too. Maybe. Yeah. Fun. So that's my question. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> There's a lot there. Um, let me just say that, or do you, you want to, no, you want me to answer it? Yes. Okay. Um, let me say that I'm going to speak now in my capacity as a citizen, drawing from this research, and I do make a distinction between research, which has to be done fairly and objectively, and should be accepted as sound by all readers. I'm a Weberian. I'm not a postmodernist. I abhor postmodernism of all kinds. So just let me say that. I'm going to step out of my scholarly uh, stance and say something about what this means to me if, for example, Democrats wanted to have a chance to do something that I think is not all but a piece of building um, robust majorities. And let me just say that again. It's not all but a piece. I mean, it is certainly true that in the big cities, uh, steps have to be taken to mobilize minorities and young people. Um, and uh, I think we all need to remember we live in a political federation. Um, and we could go back and debate why it was created by the founding fathers. I don't believe it was all about slavery and race. I think it was partly about empowering smaller places against places like New York, actually. And as somebody who grew up in Michigan, I can sympathize with that. So, you know, we live in a political federation. That means that a successful majority politics always has to be strategically ambiguous enough. You need a strategy, a direction to convey that all voters can understand what you're proposing that's good for the nation as a whole, but it has to be ambiguous enough to allow that strategy to be specified in different ways in different places. And even in the era of more national media, that's still true. I'm very struck when I visit these eight counties that they're not hanging on everything that we're hanging on in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They live in their own world, and local media and local networks do matter in what they think and believe. Uh, so that's my way of saying that one piece of building, rebuilding the Democrats, is to have a message and a presence for all places including places that they are not going to win in the House of Representatives or particular state legislative districts. There needs to be, there need to be in every place, people that folks can point to that are neighbors, friends, uh, classmates, who are Democrats. They may think they're a little peculiar for being Democrats, but they have to hear what they have to say about the issues of the day. And that means that we can't say everybody's got to be for single payer. Right. Right. 
that phrase would have caused the people I talked to who were Democrats in these conservative places to head for the hills if they understood it. Now, some of them did. Some of them were Bernie supporters. But it was better when I said Medicare for more. A lady's eyes lit up and said, that's a great idea. Has anybody talked about that? I'm thinking, oh, yeah. Um, but maybe not loudly enough, because the reason Medicare for More resonates is it's something she's already familiar with. It's not a leap into something brand new. So skip the ideal policy plans. <clears throat> skip the policy talk. Save that for Cambridge, for Columbia, for San Francisco. And talk about getting more people adequate health care. Talk about raising wages. Don't insist it has to be $15 an hour with no tips. And the people in Maine voted against that, that tip thing because they thought it was going to hurt them. They're right. They don't want in the near term. So I think the direction has to be progressive and probably more clearly articulate why that would be good for the nation as a whole and for communities and states. But the specifics have to be tailored. And that brings me to the lifestyle issues of the religious states. I mean, there are people who think that Planned Parenthood ought to be the issue that every politician in the Democratic Party has to talk about. Most of the places that we're thinking, I'm thinking about here, where the margin needs to be a little better for Democrats to have a chance, there are no Planned Parenthood claims. So why should people have to talk about that? Instead, talk about having adequate health care for women, for mothers, for families, and talk about what that concretely means in your area. Um, it's not coincidental, I think, that American public opinion switched by many very rapidly on the Affordable Care Act once these grassroots resistance movements started spelling out what was in the law. People didn't know what was in the law before because Democrats never told them what was in the law in language they could understand. Once they understood that there were things that they and their neighbors and their friends had mistaken, um, public opinion switched. Now, I want to say something about the religion thing because I just think that's so interesting. I think we need to think about Christian, Christian involvement with this kind of new populist, nativist nationalism as something that is happening in layers. First of all, as a Methodist, I want to say that there is nothing, from my perspective, very Christian about Donald Trump or about nativist um, nationalism. So, uh, not all Christians agree, you know, and uh, not all Jews. And in the places I visited, both sides of the debate about Donald Trump and his policies, particularly where they touched on immigrants and on refugees, had church people at the heart of them. Huh. The center-left people tended to be Presbyterians, Episcopals, Methodists, some Baptists. I remember the editor in the newspaper in one of the counties telling me in his Baptist church, we didn't think that Trump was really doing Christian things. <coughs> and he pulled out an article about Christian liberalism in the New York Times and said, do you know about this new movement that's sweeping the country? He was very enthusiastic. The man is very religious. He's the publisher of the local newspaper, and it's a good newspaper. And so uh, the arguments about the Affordable Care Act sometimes included people saying, this is not pro-life to get rid of health care. Now, my message would be to recognize that there's a difference between three strands here in the Christian world that Democrats need to be comfortable with understanding and working with. There's a core group of hard-nosed evangelical right-wingers, very politicized, who have been for quite some time, who believe that Islam is evil and that it is not a religion, as my Tea Party informant told me in my political system. They are not going to be persuaded. It would be fine oh, to argue with them about the Bible. I have a little argument with them about the Bible. Um, but he's not going to be persuaded. Uh, then there's another layer 
of kind of Christian evangelical Protestants and conservative Catholics who are very uneasy about mm, particularly the abortion stuff. It makes absolutely no sense at all to force Bob Casey in Pennsylvania to run on a pro total choice thing. Let him speak as a believing Catholic to what choice really means. The right to choose. According to your hypothesis. According to your um, So no litmus tests on those politically on those. That will allow that outer ring of religiously involved Protestant evangelicals to begin to understand their doubts about the evil that Donald Trump is doing. Including the evil to some of the immigrant neighbors they have. Whose families they like. Whose agony they understand personally. And then finally there are the religious liberals or the religious moderates that are often in the indivisible groups. Feeding into them. Having to work things out with their more secular democratic neighbors. Just the same way in the Tea Party back in 2009, the secular libertarians had to learn to go along with the Christian right people. But they're working it out in these movements. Those people are the ones Democrats should be reaching out and empowering in the local areas. That means you can't send somebody in who is tone deaf or uncomfortable about attending a church service or a meeting with a pastor. Um, it's just and, and you don't, uh, my, my beloved colleague, Marshall Gantz, the uh, rabbi of organizer. He's perfectly Jewish. He goes through all the Jewish rituals and everything. We all go to each other's meetings among the liberals in Massachusetts. But he's very comfortable dealing with Christian uh, language. Among, uh, and so this is something that the Democratic Party has got to understand. It needs to empower locals. It needs to listen to what they have to say about their take on the general plans to make America stronger, and uh, from, a, from a progressive point of view. And it needs to be comfortable in its own skin in um, all of these kinds of things. Excellent. So use religion against political identity. We all know that religion is diverse vast and diverse, and every world religion can justify anything. anything. Exactly. Um, questions? Nadia, maybe we should take a few. And I hope people will identify themselves, yeah, because you may all know each other, but maybe not, and, and I know some of you, but not others, and the purpose of having outside speakers is to introduce yourself to each other. Okay, I'm going to collect uh, two questions right away. Now, please. Yes, yeah, so this is Binati here from Colombia. Um, more than a question is an observation, because your, your presentation made me understood, particularly also uh, the answer to Jim, uh, that there is this incredible discrepancy between the right wing, what you described, they are very radical, very integralist, very one way, so, so it seems. And on the other side, if uh, they are the same, they lose. On the, on the left, on the right side, they win if they are radical, and one way, on the left side, they lose, which, which is exactly the opposite of what used to be uh, in the 70s or mid uh, 70s. So, my question then to you is the following. Uh, I was very pleased that the answer we gave to Gino did not go for populism, one populism against the other one. Because what we really need to have, and I agree with you, it is the renaissance of a party capable of adapting itself to the local <coughs> the specificity without uh, need, neither having this kind of uh, incentive hyper secularization, one way of thinking, on one hand, and on the other hand, no idea of unifying all into, into a one a populist discourse. This, I think, is crucially important, in my view. Thank you. I, I just say I quickly that I really agree that we have to avoid essentialisms. Yeah. Uh, we have to have discipline and direction, but we, we must not impose uniformity. And the key thing is to have values, not whether those values are 
religiously grounded or not. Charles, where are you? Talk a little louder. I'm a PhD student here at the University. Um, and, and I had a question uh, mostly about the book, uh, The Tea Party and the Remaking of uh, Republican Conservatism. And more about, um, I, I missed a little bit uh, an explanation of how the views of uh, those grassroots uh, Tea Party members come about. Are they justified to leave because of things they experience in it? or are those beliefs perhaps influenced by uh, the media they watch um, and how, how should we treat uh, those beliefs? Um, and what are the okay, okay, so, uh, so let's have your question to the president. My name is Sarah, resident of New York City for 15 years. If America was founded on the basis of separate religion and state, why is all of our politics so wound up with pro-choice, anti-choice religion? Can we get out of it? No, 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 that's fine. Uh, look, I, th I, th I think that um, uh, my, my, it would be a long answer, but, but there used to be, if you read my book, uh, Civic Engagement in American Democracy or, or Diminished Democracy, which was about voluntary association throughout US history, you would see that um, through much of American history from the founding until the 1960s, there were all kinds of moral associations, including fraternal groups and women's groups that drew people together across class lines. And those were often touted in politicians' biographies and emphasized in politics. They were not religion per se. They were in many ways ways to bridge across originally Protestant denominations and then uh, from World War I and World War II on to include Jews and Catholics and the, and the things that needed to be bridged. Uh, but then all those other ways to be moral, to express morality and social associations collapsed. And what we're left with is an energized uh, Christian evangelical sector which became tied up in politics in resistance to the civil rights movement and its aftermath. Uh, and then, uh, now we're at the final iteration of this, where we're, well, nothing's ever final in history, but we're at the next iteration, where, where basically um, secularists are beginning to grow up um, um, and be assertive about their secularism in a way that, um, probably was never true even in earlier stages. The founding fathers actually were not big Christians. They were Masons. <laughs> and they were Jews. And uh, that's a very uncomfortable thing to talk with conservatives about. But a lot and short of it is that we're in a period now where the, a certain brand of assertive, congregationally based Christianity, which represents the only source of community for many people, in a very fragmented society and set of workplaces is asserting itself from these smaller non-metropolitan areas against the rise of things that are attracting their children. You see, their children are leaving for those things. <coughs> so generational tensions are also uh, rising in this. And each side thinks of itself as the real America. They think they're the America that is being that gets into the beliefs. These people, these Tea Party people and these Trump people before them think America is being destroyed. Um, and that means that things are changing in ways they find confusing and frightening, both on the world stage and in the society itself, including in their own families. One of our chief findings in the Tea Party book was that resentment of one's own grand nieces and nephews was part of the picture. So that's not just race. Um, and then the other side is the kind of uh, vision that Barack Obama articulated, which is a, of a more cosmopolitan, confident, outreach America based on the rising young and more multicultural um, um, sense. And he said that went all the way back to America's founding. The truth is both of these things go all the way back to America's founding, and, and, and they can clash in different ways in different periods. I just I briefly want to say about Tea Party beliefs. I mean, if you read the book, you'll see that we tried to get them to tell in the individual interviews. We tried to get people to tell us their life stories. And it was very much grounded in the 
the sense of themselves as hardworking Americans dealing with changes uh, that Barack Obama kind of crystallized for them, that uh, we're, we're changing America as they knew it. When we got down to particular issues, we did find that anger about immigration was a very common thread, even in places where people didn't hardly know any immigrants. And anger and fear at Muslims, and that's a post-9-11. Yeah, just uh, the question. This was a wonderful talk, and uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty convinced, even by the strategic suggestion at the end that you gave in response to questions. But there is still a puzzle. It's a kind of comparativist puzzle. Jean didn't mention that you're also the author of a comparative work on states and social revolutions. And since then, you've been working. You've been working. It's a long time, but it's still a book that we use in class, yeah, so it's still alive. Still but, uh, as my students, <laughs> as my students know, yes. and you have become an American since. Yes. And of course, uh, those of us who are comparativists uh, uh, probably would uh, still want to register the fact that this authoritarian slide, or what we call authoritarian <coughs> populism, or extension of it is kind of international, it's elsewhere too. But uh, uh, there's a significant difference uh, between what you describe and what you see in lots of places. I think it's convincing, very convincing, in your analysis that you bring together the organizational side. It was quite beautiful, uh, Lenin's organization uh, on the one side, and popular anger, popular mobilization on the other side. These two sides are everywhere. You will find it in different versions and different organizations will play their role. But the ideological disjuncture between them is not as great as here. I mean, what you described was really almost like two distinct ideologies, two uh, life worlds, two kinds of concerns. And, and then, of course, we all know, and you described this too, is that Trump is, is a figure who can actually who can bridge that gap in some way, or he bridged that gap at least during the election. But of course, he's not bridging it now, <laughs> given the kind of cabinet he appointed. And the question is whether that kind of bridging to a person. Well, there's his cabinet and there's his tweets. There's his cabinet and his tweets. <laughs> and there's his man. There's a cabinet and there's a and they're, they're the two sides. But is, that, is it really possible to, to continue to bridge that gap to uh, leadership primarily, I mean, that's the, that's the issue, because it's certainly not, not the way it works elsewhere. <coughs> uh, the populist uh, organizations elsewhere that would play the role that you describe to Americans for Prosperity are much closer ideologically uh, to, their, to their base. That's true. Well, American politics is more decoupled. I mean, I, I'm not going to go on and on about the comparative thing, mostly because I don't know enough, but I will say this, that a great deal depends on the existing party system and on the pre-existing welfare state. And also a great deal depends on, on, on where a country stands in the flow of refugees. You know, a lot of what's happening here really was a side effect of the Syrian war and the pouring of, of Syrians uh, into, into Europe in such large numbers. Um, so, uh, it, 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 Ironically, the situation is so dangerous in the United States because these tendencies have captured one of two major political parties in a two-party system. Um, if it happens in a multi-party system, to some degree it can be in a third or fourth party. That still creates all kinds of temptations that belong to the other parties, but it isn't quite as dangerous as the situation that in the United States where uh, all of Washington is controlled by one party and the Supreme Court is on the verge. But it's two tendencies that capture the party, right? Yes. And they are involved in a leveraging operation of convenience. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, hi, Richard John. Hi, Richard. It's nice to see you. Yeah, I see you. A quick observation and then a question. The observation is having just spent five weeks teaching Steve Waldman's founding faith, I'm by a book by a journalist about the founders of Christianity. I'm persuaded that the founders were not here. And I just tossed that out. Okay. And that might be a way for Democrats to reach out. Some of them were deals. Right. Well, he, he goes through the big five and he contends none. <laughs> the big five are? Well, 
Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, and, uh, and Madison. Uh, it was an interesting, interesting argument, but it also, he's trying to reach out to evangelicals and make an argument from the center. Uh, but the question is about the military. Um, you've done Kelly, chief of staff, military men. Uh, you've done an awful lot of ethnographic work. Uh, is the mil you haven't talked much about the military or foreign policy until your last comment. Uh, could you say something about democratic, republican divide on the military, how the Democrats can reach out as a citizen, and then say something about foreign policy issues and are the, the tr Trump Tea Party going to be interventionist, not interventionist? What do, what do we have to, you know, give me open to talk about foreign policy in the military. Hi. Um, my name is Danielle. I'm a PhD student in the communications program here. Um, my question is about NAFTA and um, free market. So where does uh, the sort of conflict, I guess, of Trump talking about withdrawing from NAFTA and becoming more insular conflict with the AFP's more free, free market aspects? And is that an opportunity or is that just a uh, smoke signal, like sort of a smoke screen? Uh, I'll take one more. I think your question. Um, do you think, well, my name is Jason, um, I'm an here. Talk louder. Uh, my name is Jason Capel. <coughs> Sorry, my name is Jason Capel, I'm an MA student here. Okay. Uh, do you think enough attention was paid to the simple fact that a lot of Republicans, conservatives, Trump supporters, whatever, simply won't take their fingers out of their ears, and it can be very hard to reason with them? Sure. Well, um, I, I want to say, uh, in response to that last question, that uh, research shows that all people, and that would be including us in this room, are likely to absorb information in ways that reinforce our priors. Uh, when I told that to Derek Bach, former President of Carter, who believes that education solves all problems, he's very, very discussed. <laughs> Um, now, that doesn't mean that facts don't matter. The second thing I'll say about that is that the media environment is a big contributor to all of this. The media's the competitive dynamics gave uh, Trump that $2 billion of free media coverage. Many of the participants in that were thinking he had no chance, but they'd make a little money on the way he was not being elected. Uh, but the right-wing media is truly a machine. It has made a difference. And for many people, it's now supplemented by websites where they get all of their, um, not just information, misinformation, but e emotion. That was true when we interviewed the Tea Partiers. Question number seven on the list was, um, where do you get your news? And I remember very distinctly a man was smiling across the table at the Comfort Inn where we were doing the interview saying, not what you do. He was right. Uh, and we found, and research found, that Tea Party people watch Fox News from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And if you do that, you're, you're just going to have a warped view of not just the facts, but a constant drumbeat of uh, racial fear mongering. Uh, the closest I come to hearing that is when I turn on 6 o'clock in the morning WEEI Sports Radio in Boston. I'm a fanatic NFL fan. But I'm at the point now where I can't even take it uh, anymore because it's all racial innuendo. Um, so they aren't getting information, and the current media environment is more fragmented than ever before and allows separate worlds to, to develop. Um, that's a danger in a democracy and in a republic. And so I, I think that, I don't know what to say about it, but it's an institutional factor that's an important backdrop to all of this. Um, NAFTA. You know, I do think that in states like Ohio and parts of Pennsylvania, um, Trump did peel away some Democrats, and the unions will tell you this, uh, with that message. That message, however, has to be understood as a I'm on your side symbolic message, not a real message. Uh, for example, my sister lives in West Virginia. If you go down there, you can find a few of those folks who really think the coal jobs are coming back. But in the counties that I'm visiting, if I talk to conservative people, and I do, I talk to them all, they don't really Um, but they do appreciate the fact that Trump came and held rallies. 
right near them and talked about some of the feelings that they have. Um, the biggest community crisis that's very objectively real and that's present everywhere and that would, would offer an opening to any party or movement that can speak to it is the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis is devastating across so many communities. It causes business people to say they can't find workers where they work. They talk about their neighbors the way we social scientists think that blacks are talked about. The people are talking about are all white. Um, and the sense of disintegration that social service professionals and teachers feel, the families, the bewilderment about finding a young person dead in their bed, which is what happens. Um, so having a message about how entire communities can mobilize all their resources, health resources, not a program, but a let's do it together, let's find out what works and work on this together, would speak to something that is happening now, not happened in the 70s in these places, and there's no reason Democrats can't do that, except that they don't go to these places a lot. And, they, and, the, and the Democrats in these places tell me everywhere, no one cares about this. We don't hear from the state party. We don't hear from the national party. We're on our own. Uh, so um, I do think that the, the, the trade stands matter, that they're largely symbolic, and that, that gets at how Trump can engage in this saber rattling and his tweets and still be going for the blast with the Coke Network. The Coke Network wants free trade. They want immigration. They want low wages and people to, 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 to exploit from anywhere. And to the degree that they have sincere value beliefs, and I think they do, they really do believe in a libertarian free market way of looking at things, and they think anybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and they kind of like it. And there are a fair number of people in the business community who do too. And it's not just that they admire that they work for low wages, they also think they should turn up to work on time and they work hard and they want to get ahead. And all these things are, as a matter of fact, true. So uh, I think that, that it can work for Trump because he's actually doing the things that the Cokes want, or at least not doing too many things that the Wall Street editorial board doesn't want. But he's talking a good deal. Another message. <laughs> And then the military foreign policy, I, I, this is not really my, too, too I do think the military side of this is socially important in the United States. Um, military people tend to, tend to be Republicans and they tended to support Trump. But in the eight counties that I visited between late April and mid-July, the only conservatives I heard who expressed the slightest scintilla of doubt about Donald Trump, and it was just a scintilla, don't get excited, were military. Right. So. And one of, one of them said to me, uh, well, I thought he should, Trump should have called Comey in and fired him face to face like Obama did at that general. And I realized after the interview, when I went home and thought about it, in the military, commanders cashier people all the time, but they call them in and they do it face to face. It's manly, even if you're a woman. It's family to do it that way. And Trump doesn't, he's a coward, you know? He's a coward. And um, they were known, he was noticing that. Now, I don't know if that's gonna go anywhere. Another retired military Republican leader uh, was disturbed that Trump wasn't staffing the federal government, including the State Department. Well, you know, everybody's all excited about General Kelly. He's gonna somehow limit all this. We've seen in the last week that military people can believe the nativist nationalism thing, and, and General Kelly clearly does. Uh, that's how he's able to stay as chief of staff. What he would do if Donald Trump decided to, to start dropping nuclear weapons, I have no idea. But I'm not real confident. We do the right thing. Okay. So, okay, I'm uh, Michael, and then... Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Mike, a PhD student here at Columbia in political science. Uh, I had, uh, I guess, a historical question. How would you account for sort of the... Uh, initial move by the Koch network into party politics? Like, what factors made that possible um, during the 2000s? Uh, okay, well, let's take another question. Yes, I, I'm walking around the way. No, 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 yeah. Student, my student. Okay. Walk up, wait, wait, wait. 
Go ahead, Nick. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, either Bill. or. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm the only person here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What? Don't be so sure. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I agree with virtually everything you said in terms of political tactics. But from the point of view of the Democrats, uh, I see a big question. It's difficult to beat something with nothing, even if the something is specious. Uh, and what Trump has and Republicans have is uh, kind of passionate intensity for a nostalgic view of restoring American greatness. The overall reality is America is declining, the West is declining, and decline is not in the political vocabulary of the United States. And I think, in a strange way, Trump saying the American dream is dead, but I'll bring it back to life, versus whatever the Democrats said in regard to decline, jobs, economy, general, left people with a choice, something which is specious and ugly versus, sadly, something that is almost nothing and shocking. Any thoughts on that at all? All right. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Rob Goodman, I'm also a Rob, PhD Rob. student at Columbia. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little, a little bit. Louder, yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you call the market anarchism among the uh, left-wing billionaires. Um, what are some of the factors driving that? And I also wonder if, um, now that they're more aware of the success of the Koch strategy to be more coordinated, if they're considering changing tactics, or if they can't because of some structural constraints on them. Okay. Um, okay. Let me um, take these in turn. They're all good questions. Um, and I, sh I should say that. Um, Alex Hurdle Fernandez and I and our, our, our colleagues have, have published some things. So there's a paper on the development of the Cook Network that appeared in Perspectives in Politics, the uh, Outreach Journal of the Political Science Association in September of 2016. It really answers all these questions about what the network is and how it evolved. Um, and then, um, and we're continuing to do more work, and then um, a paper that should still be on the APSA website that was presented by Alex and Vanessa and I, comparing the Democracy Alliance and the uh, um, Koch uh, seminars, um, says more, a lot more, about the evolution of the Democracy Alliance, which I only briefly touched on here. Um, the Koch Network moved into party-like politics. You know, the best biographers of David and Charles, and they're only two of the four brothers, are very clear that they've been concerned with a sort of free market libertarianism for a very long time. And their first forays into that were to fund idea creation. And that, by the way, is continually <coughs> intensified. So they're not giving up on that at all. They've changed their tactics. They've figured out that university people can be bribed to do just about anything. <laughs> so you don't have to set up standalone uh, operations. Um, that's a good point. I mean, we all take money and we do too. So I, I don't, I'm not impugning anybody's integrity. Um, it's just that if you offer money for research, people will come up with plans to do it. Um, so um, they started with ideas, then they moved into issue advocacy and experimented with the Libertarian Party. And I think what's remarkable about the two brothers, particularly Charles, and whoever it is that's been advising them, and apparently it's this guy, Fink, who I would love to interview, um, they think about what works and what doesn't and change things. And because they are authoritarian industrialists, they can change things. I think those things are probably related. People are likely to think about what works and make changes if they could change things. So that's part of the explanation of the greater adaptability. Uh, but I think they realized under George uh, Bush Jr., uh, the younger Bush, that just influencing the Republican Party with contributions to individual politicians and issue advocacy wasn't working. Because Bush went off in directions both in foreign policy and domestic that they hated. So that's when they teamed up with Tim Phillips, who came out of the Christian right world, and who obviously played a very important role in helping them understand the federated part of 
Leninist Federalist. I would love to interview Tim Phillips. I'm trying, but I'm not sure they're going to agree. If they read our work, they cite it in their prospectuses to their donors. Uh, so they know about our work, and they've changed their websites to try to frustrate our data gap. <laughs> but I don't know that they're going to talk with us, and it's only by talking that you get that final piece of understanding where the ability to figure out some of these fascinating organizational and structural things about what works in America came from. Um, on the DA side, and I, I will come back to the something for nothing because it's a powerful comment. Um, on the DA side, um, please read the paper, but from the beginning, the Democracy Alliance was trying to kind of herd millionaires and billionaires who are liberals. Millionaires and billionaires who are liberals tend to be heirs of fortunes rather than still an active businessmen. And they kind of, they have relationships with professionals who do good work in the advocate, liberal advocacy world. They tend to believe in the causes and the policies or the identity groups that those various professionals are tied in. So as the Democracy Alliance is being put together, originally with the idea that they would pour a lot of money into a tightly knit set of things around the institutional presidential Democratic Party, because liberals tend to be focused on the presidency, and set up things like CAP, Center, Center for American Progress, etc. The ability to recruit members depended on bringing their causes in with them. So within just a few years, the original model of recommending a few core organizations for people to give their donations to them be approved against the minimum uh, exploded. And you had lots of groups on the list. And they've gone through waves of this. Um, you know, they tried to reform the process and they demoted a bunch, I call them sheep and goats, and they took a lot of people off the sheep list and put them on the goat list. And if you don't know what that means, you need to read the Bible. Um, uh, so, you know, <laughs> we were interviewing two DA people, and the lady said to me, I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, I bet you don't. So, now they've read our work too. We know them. I know them. Uh, you know, they're cooperating with us. They're giving us not all the data, they won't give us their membership. That they've given us their programs. So, you know, they're trying to figure out ways to do comparably strategic things to the Coke Network, but all by building more state capacity, state level capacity. But there is no way that one side can simply imitate the other. They both look at each other. Social movement scholars know that social movements look at each other. But you, if you're running a social movement, you have to deal with the material, human, and resource material at hand. And on the left, you're blessed with people who know issues, who care about issues, who um, are committed to inclusion, who think it's more important whether you have the right type of person on the board than whether that, whether that person is actually succeeded in winning the class campaign. Um, and, you know, that's different. <coughs> um, they have their own weaknesses. Their weaknesses can be that they can get locked into something that can take them down. You know, the weaknesses of all of their attorneys. So I just think it's a fascinating thing. I don't have any simple answers, but they are looking at each other. They are, particularly since last November, when the assumption that Hillary Clinton would win and that everything could be about pushing her from the left, because there are a lot of Sanders people in the um, That collapsed, and now they're suddenly saying, well, maybe we have to build power in the states. But that's not easy to do, especially when the public sector unions are being destroyed. Um, something for nothing. I want to say yes, something about right. yes. That is absolutely right. I, I'm not going to get into a big critique of Hillary Clinton. I just can't bring myself to do that. And I think she had much more to say than anybody heard, because the media filtered and never let it be heard, and because she adopted tactics that have to do with the dilemmas that women face in powerful positions, which are intractable. She 
writes about that in the book. But the truth of the matter is the party as a whole, not just Hillary Clinton, did not convey a message of action as opposed to being. It talked about better together. Now, better together is fine. We do want to convey a message of America is stronger when the, all the strands are woven together. That is absolutely true. It's always been true. It's the reason America has a chance to pull itself out of decline. I don't think decline is absolutely determined. America is still a very dynamic place. It's still a splendid country that takes people from all backgrounds and all over the world and creates innovation and strength. You're hearing here a starry-eyed American patriot. But the Democrats in this last election, and even at times under Obama, did not clearly articulate what are we going to do that's going to be good for the nation together and communities together. And we're often unwilling to lay out demands or ideas about what we could do if they didn't think they could get them through the next Congress. Well, politics is about creating an identity and a direction. It's about arousing enthusiasm and emotion. Obama did that at moments. He didn't, it, the baton didn't get picked up by the party as a whole. And it's really not just all on presidents or presidential candidates. It can't be. It has to be something that's happening at all levels. So unless Democrats can do that, I agree that this combination of mutually leveraging fanaticisms and extremisms is going to be able to hold on. And since a lot of what they're doing is ramming through regulations and laws that are disorganizing and disabling and discouraging their opponents, it could lock in. But I don't think it has to. A lot lies on Democrats and on the center leftists in general, including Republicans who don't like things out there, to come up with a more robust, I hate the word message, a more robust project that they organize our fellow citizens to do. And by the way, speak in plain English. Skip the policy talk. Um, I hate that. Doubt 
Bob voted for him. And I think that his constant belittling of women, and that has absolutely been a constant throughout the campaign, it's there right now, is replacing <coughs> Janet Yellen with somebody who supports all of the policies. Now maybe it's because he's a Republican and she's a Democrat, okay, I'll maybe. But one has the strong <coughs> suspicion that the last thing he was going to do was keep a woman in a key position like that. Because he goes after Sonia Sotomayor and Peter Ginsburg. Interestingly enough, I'm not Elena Kagan yet. I don't know what that's about. But it, uh, Hillary Clinton, the constant um, belittling. And I think that that was almost strategic on his part as well as visceral. I think he understood that it, we are in a moment in this society where there's a lot of tension about immigration, about our place in the world. There's a continuing and new versions of tensions about race, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the horrible incidents of police violence that uh, got national attention just going into this cycle. But there's also a lot of tension at all levels of American society about the changing role of women. Come on, I've lived through this. I can tell you, women's role has changed enormously in families, workplaces and the professions in the last half century. And all people in this society <coughs> and in their life are dealing still with the unsettled results of that. So at an unconscious level in the case of many educated professionals, men and women alike, and at a more conscious level for many working class people, and There's something cathartic and acceptable. Saying it like it is, one of those other people. We're out of place. And he knows that. And he's doing it. And I think it is a source of his strength. And for Hillary Clinton, it was a terrible dilemma. She decided to run for president. Democrats decided to get behind her and make those papers mistake about it. Many millions more Democrats voted for Hillary Clinton and voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary. Don't give me any of this nonsense about him being a Democratic preference. Unless we want to rule out black and brown people. And I don't think I do. She was the Democrats' choice. But that choice was made before anybody knew it was going to be Donald Trump, before anybody could even imagine. In retrospect, it turns out Joe Biden would have been the right choice. Um, and almost everybody I talk to in the conservative world out in the local communities tells me they're pretty sure Biden would have won. Uh, but, you know, by the time it was Donald Trump, look at what she had to deal with. The constant humiliation. At least she handled it with dignity, didn't she? From beginning to end. But I don't know that she had an answer for it. And it worked for him. I do think it was part of the input of hope for God for many men. Um, some of them.